So you just completed a great course on machine learning and you are feeling fantastic. You now know all of the ins and outs of linear regression, random forest models and support vector machines. Now it's time for the fun part. But let's get started with a real world data set. But when you try to apply all of these lovely models you've just learned, you just can't seem to get them to make accurate predictions. What's going on here? I'm Jodie Birchall, and I'm the developer advocate in data science at JetBrains. In this video, I'll be trying to summarize my 20 or so years experience with data preparation in less than 10 minutes. And I'm going to give you an overview of the most important issues you can encounter when preparing data for machine learning and some tips on how to fix them. So let's get started. It seems really obvious, but a lot of the issues that can affect your models come from errors or just general weird patterns in your data set. And this has happened to me more times than I'd like to admit. The easiest way to screen for these is to simply inspect your summary statistics or data visualizations when you first read in your data. There are a few common causes of messy data. One cause is implausible values, which indicate some sort of possible error in your data, such as here where we have a very suspicious looking negative sale price. Another are outliers. These are extreme values which can distort certain types of models. We can see some here in this variable. And then finally, we have missing values, such as we can see here in this garage type variable. When missing values have a relationship with your features or your target, they can affect how well your models are going to generalize. As you probably guessed from your own experience, there are a lot of reasons that you can end up with messy data. And these range from issues when the data was written to problems with the sample that you pulled. It's really important to take the time to work out why these issues are happening. This is going to help you clean up your data as well as possible prior to building that model. Most of the time when you're working with data in a company, unfortunately, your data sets aren't going to be collected specifically for your models. Instead, you're going to have to make do with what's already there. And this is usually data that's collected for reporting or as part of the core running of your company. So this means that sometimes no one in the company will have any idea of what some fields mean. And before you laugh, this has happened to me on more than one occasion. Luckily, there are some simple statistical tricks that we can use to work out what our data is really measuring. One trick you can use is simply see what an unknown variable relates to. Your variable is going to correlate highly with variables that measure something similar, and it's going to correlate weakly with variables that measure something different. You know, it kind of makes sense, right? So you can see that here. We have this mysterious variable gert live r, and we don't know what it means. But what we can see is that it correlates highly with total rooms above ground and it correlates weakly with the year that the house was built. So we can go out on a limb and we can guess that this variable is measuring the ground living area. Another thing to look out for is variables that correlate too highly with your target. So you can see that here. Our target is sales price and we have this variable auction floor that's correlating at 0.95, a very high correlation with this target. So this is a phenomenon known as feature leakage, and this is where a feature contains information from the target. If you include these features in your model, what you're going to get is overly optimistic performance as you're including variables that contain information that the model won't have access to when they need to make their predictions. You need to therefore remove all such variables from your feature list. If you want to read more about the tips from this video, you can also check out the pinned tweet on my Twitter account at tredactyl. I've linked to a blog post where I explain in a lot more detail on how to find and fix these tricky data issues. When creating a model, it's very important to define what population you want your model to best predict. So for example, a model trained to predict house prices in the United States, or even one specific area of the United States, is not going to make good predictions for house prices in other areas. Pretty straightforward, right? So once you defined your population, you need to make sure that your data set reflects it. This is what's called creating a representative sample of your population of interest. Unfortunately, it's actually quite easy to create biased data sets that don't properly represent your population. One of the most important types of bias is called selection bias. And this is where you manage to sample only a subset of your population. So for example, in our housing data set, you might have only sampled high income neighborhoods, and this would lead to an inflated estimate of how much a house is likely to sell for. 
checking that the distribution of your features and your target look correct based on what you already know about your population is one good way of checking for selection bias before you accidentally train a bias model. Another very tricky issue that can affect your models is when your data contains imbalanced categorical variables. Well, what are these? What are categorical variables? They're those variables that contain groups like cities or types of restaurants, and they're imbalanced when these groups contain really different numbers of observations. When your target is imbalanced, this is an issue for how well your model can learn. So let's take this categorical target, for example, whether the house will sell. You can see that houses end up selling 95% of the time. So our target is really imbalanced. Targets like this lead to lazy models because the model can simply guess this majority outcome and still perform well. They don't actually learn much about the relationship between the features and the target. It's also a problem when categorical features are imbalanced, such as with these building type, house style and roof style features. It's particularly a problem when you have a lot of these imbalanced features, as you can easily end up with combinations where you have only a couple of observations. So let's have a look at such a case. What you can see here is that when the building type equals two family conversion and when house style equals 2.5 fin, we have only one observation. These sort of cases make it really hard for your model to learn general patterns because there's simply not enough data for the model to learn from. Two important remedies for imbalanced variables, especially imbalanced targets, are under and oversampling. These are simply techniques where you either remove data from your larger groups or you generate data in your smaller groups and you use the data that you already have there as a seed to do this. For imbalanced features, we also have feature engineering. This is another very important remedy. Feature engineering can range from very simple techniques like combining your categories based on your domain knowledge to statistical techniques like principal components analysis or word embeddings. One final thing to consider is whether you have a good estimate of how well your model will perform in production once it's processing fresh data. This is actually surprisingly tricky. All data samples contain their own quirks. So training a model too hard on your sample means it's going to learn those unique features of your training data set and not generalize well to new data. This is a phenomenon known as overfitting. The way to solve this is by dividing your original data set into three identical subsets. The first is the training set, which is obviously going to be used to train your data. The second is the validation set, which you're going to use to compare the performance of each model that you train. And finally, you create a test set, which you use only once to check the performance of your best performing model. The reason for creating these separate validation and test sets is that repeatedly using the same validation set for comparing your models means that you can overfit to both the training set and the validation set. Like I said, it's tricky. Having this pristine test set set aside that's used only once means that you're going to get an estimate of how well the model is going to perform in the real world. I hope this brief video has given you a taster of some of the issues that can pop up in real world data and how to spot and start fixing them. If you'd like to try out some of the things that I talked about in this video to create more robust data for your own models, you can sign up for Data Law, our collaborative data science platform. All of the examples I used in this video were created using Data Law, and as you can see, it has some unique features that make spotting data pitfalls quick and easy. You can try it out yourself online at this link or host a private version within your own company. Please also leave any feedback or questions you have below. And as I mentioned earlier, you can reach out to me directly on Twitter. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.